Um, so I'm, I'm talking today about uh, the, uh, the new experiment and uh, it's mostly about the technical analysis and the lessons learned uh, from a unique experiment. And this experiment was unique also in the sense that we collect 100 hours of data on Alpha Centauri. So it's a very long and very homogeneous data set, which uh, allows you to study uh, many things uh, related to, to uh, infrared, thermal infrared imaging. Um, there are also two other presentations or so Andy's Mayor's talk tomorrow morning, for example, which uh, more focuses on the chronographic results. And then there's also Kevin Wagner's poster who addresses some of the campaign scientific results. So um, here is a, um, a sample of hypothetical exo uh, Earth-like exoplanets in the habitable zone around real nearby stars. And they are displayed in the separation versus contrast uh, uh, space. And you see in green, uh, the curve, what could put possibly be achieved with, um, uh, with a mid infrared instrument at an eight meter class telescope uh, in 100 hours. And you can see that the green curve is the, the, the star that's most near uh, next to the green curve is the Alpha Sen system. It's the most nearby, so the angular separation is good. Uh, the planets are brighter, so the contrast region is also not so bad. So, this is what we the green area is what we want to look at. And uh, in the Alpha Sen system, you see Earth like planets are still out of reach, but one could potentially uh, reach uh, mini Neptunes in the habitable zone around Alpha Centauri. And that was the scientific goal, also realized uh, by the Breakthrough Initiatives Watch Committee. And uh, so this collaboration between ESO and the Breakthrough Initiative was launched uh, in 2016, I believe, late 2016. And uh, the share was mostly that breakthrough initiatives uh, contributed the funds for this and ESO contributed the workforce and the task of time. So here's a, a short overview, what is NEAR exactly? So most of all, NEAR is Vizier. So it uses a Vizier instrument. And the idea was to use, uh, to move Vizier to UT4, which is a one that is equipped with a deformable secondary mirror. So that means that uh, at UT4, Vizier can use adaptive optics without additional warm surfaces. It's a big advantage for sky background. On top of that, the, the DSM uh, also would allow for fast chopping. Um, and also we uh, installed a new filter uh, and uh, Leo stop into the instrument. So here in this, sorry, no. Someone block. Nine, nine, two, a bit two. Sorry for that. Um, so uh, you see here in this uh, in this in this graph, uh, there is uh, the warm flange where most of the modifications were installed, and there are, there are two main things that can be seen here in the center. Um, you see uh, a, a tub tubular structure, which is an internal chopping device. I come to this in a few slides, and you see a small optical relay that uh, sends light to a, a visible check Hartmann wavefront sensor. So these were the two main main modifications in the warm part in front of the cryostat desk. So and in the following slides, I come a bit to the individual points, to the individual uh, modifications that have been done to this year. Um, the first is the adaptive optics. So we use a deformable secondary and check Hartmann wavefront sensor, and we use uh, the uh, the adaptive optics facility, real-time computer for that, with the adaptive optic facility standard um, components, uh, parameters. So we operate at one kilohertz correction range and with a loop gain of 0.5. And we achieve a very good strain ratio that can be seen here on the bottom left. So this is an image obtained in N-band um, during the near commissioning. And you can see that's essentially a perfect image with a very high strain ratio. Um, the AO calls for pupil stabilized observations because the, the pupil, which is a deformable secondary mirror, must not rotate with respect to the wavefront sensor. So we stabilize the pupil, which is actually an, of advantage uh, for infrared imaging, as we have heard uh, earlier today, and I also will stress in my talk again. And um, so in, for the signal to noise ratio, it means that uh, it's proportional to the strain ratio, and we, we gain a factor of about two to three with respect to regular observation without adaptive optics in the end. -band. So strain ratios go from like 30 or 50% in end -band to something like uh, close to 100%. The next uh, modification was uh, that, that we can also use this deformable mirror for very fast chopping. And you can see here on the upper left side, 
there is a plot uh, that was done during the, 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 the first engineering uh, tests. So you see here that the position of the DSM in tip tilt as a function of time. And okay, on the on the y-axis, we have the tip tilt amplitude, in this case, mechanical on the DSM. So 10 arc seconds correspond to two point arc seconds in sky. And what you can see here is that the position, uh, the chopping transition is reached well within 10 milliseconds and that the maximum chopping throw that we can achieve is 5.6 arc seconds. And now on the right side, I will start a, a, a short movie, which will show the DSM, uh, the Vizier image, while the DSM is chopping on alpha sand. And you can see that uh, very quickly we jump between alpha sen A and B. So the, to the upper right, you see alpha sen B, to the lower left, alpha sen A. And in the center, you see the chronographic uh, mask, uh, which has a, a central flow. And the 5.6 arc second for alpha sen is OK, as long as we observed before uh, 2020. So uh, today, the, 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 uh, the operation between the two stars is about 5.5 arc seconds. Uh, when we did our campaign in, in 2019, the separation was of the order of five arc seconds. The problem is that from next year on, the, the DSM stroke is not anymore enough to chop between the two stars. Um, NIR also has, an, uh, has another feature, which is an internal chopper. Uh, it's also called a Dicker switch. So the, the main component of this Dicker switch is seen to the lower right. It is a, um, a bowl-shaped mirror here in gold which is half open. And this mirror rotates. And, and while it um, basically the instrument sees the, the open part of the mirror, it looks onto the sky. And when the closed part rotates into the field of view, uh, the instrument sees an internal black body. And the black body is adjusted in brightness to match the brightness of the sky. And um, I have here a short movie which shows this operation. So you can see now we are looking at the back side of this rotating mirror. And now we are looking into the instrument, the cold instrument, colder than minus 60 degrees. And now after half a, half a cycle, the back side of the mirror uh, comes uh, into the field of view again. So the fast chopping is mostly needed to reduce uh, the excess low frequency noise. And you can see here from our commissioning data, uh, where, we, where we had the Dicker switch rotating with one hertz, with two hertz, with five hertz, and with 10 hertz. And you can see on the lower left the corresponding reduction in, um, uh, in, in noise. So a sensitivity gain between the standard four hertz shopping and the 10 hertz shopping that is a maximum we can achieve is quite significant. It's about a factor of 1.5 better SNR uh, that we achieve with the fast shopping, either with the Dicker switch or with the DSM. The next uh, modification was uh, a specialized filter. Um, you see here the, in blue the sky spectrum. And uh, obviously, the, re the region between 10 microns and 12.5 microns is the one that's, that's least affected uh, by emission from the night sky. And it's, it's also it, this spectral range is, is one where planets are bright. And if we, if we choose a filter that goes from 10 to 12.5 microns, we have about a twice larger band pass and throughput than the widest filter currently in this year, which is a B10.7 filter. And this would also result in a signal to noise gain of roughly a square root of two. Finally, the internal chronograph need, needed an optimized Leo stop. Um, so we have here design, uh, which looks a bit funny on the left. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of structure. It's not just a simple uh, binary mask. And the reason is that this structure is there. It's an upwardization of the area rings between the region of three and eight arc seconds, which is shown on the right side. So you can see that we suppress the area pattern in this region. And the main reason for that is if we chop with about five arc second uh, throw, then of course the off-axis star, the area pattern would, 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 would uh, spoil the high contrast region on the chronograph. And that's why we have this special design to provide a good chronographic projection in the center. Um, the downside, but this unavoidable of, of such uh, upper-dice Leo stops where you also oversize the central obscuration is that you reduce the relative throughput in the PSF. So it means that instead of, uh, let's say, we reduce by 50% the amount of flux that we have in the PSF core. So here we have a loss of about a factor of two in signal to noise ratio. Another nice feature of uh, this upper-dicer 
Uh, on the top right, you see the actual device, so with the chromium mask uh, um, coated, overcoated on our spectral filter, that it cuts the telescope background. So the left image is uh, the vizier uh, pupil, where you see central obscuration, uh, and you see also in the outer part some excess light that is uh, reaching the, that's the instrument, um, light that is outside the main mirror of the telescope. And when we then put our Leo stop, we cut all this light. And if you do the photometry uh, between these two images here, this one and this one, we count, we count the, the flux that you see, we see that we have remove about 50% of the thermal background. So by having this good mask, uh, we gain another square root of two. So now there were lots of factors uh, gaining and losing that are, that are presented. And so here, here is the summary. So uh, what is the expected signal to noise ratio of the near um, configuration with respect to the previous vizier configuration with the B10.7 filter. You can see that summer, uh, multiplying all these gain factors, uh, we have a total gain of about a factor of three to 4.5. Uh, that's what we would expect uh, is near. And the typical sensitivity of vizier with the B10.7 is about 3.5 millijasty, 10 sigma one hour. And uh, so what we would expect is about um, half a millijansky, five sigma per hour with near. And then on top of that, there is a coronagraphy where we can only use the chop half cycle where the star is on the chronograph. So we are losing another square root of two here. And so our final prediction was 0.75 millijansky, five sigma per hour. And um, so this is a bit a pretty good sensitivity and actually it's confirmed on sky. So from now on, I, 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 I'm not talking about any more about the instrument concept, but about the results that we actually achieved on sky. And you can see here from the science demonstration observations of Sirius, uh, where we clearly detect Sirius B in two hours at a signal to noise ratio of uh, 43, um, that this is pretty dead on our expectation of about 0.75 millichans really five sigma per hour. So let's say our, our sensitivity estimate is confirmed. Uh, on the chopping between alpha and A, I showed you the movie before. Here you see uh, pictures of what, uh, what, what happens in the two chopping cycles. So on the left side, you see the alpha and A on the chronograph. Uh, alpha and B is off axis. And on the right side, you see the image with alpha and B on the chronograph and alpha and A off axis. The central bright spot here is, is, is not the star or the chronographic residual. It's, it's something that's called the, the glow of the AGPM. It, the AGPM unfortunately takes thermal light from behind the secondary and outside the M1 and, and, and puts it into the center of the field. But it subtracts very well um, when, we, when we start the chopping operation. Um, another important thing is, I mentioned before, we use pupil tracking. And uh, what we actually realize is that if you use pupil tracking, the nodding subtraction is not really needed. And this can be understood from comparing data that has been taken in the old Vizier configuration, in this case Sirius, with the field stabilization that you see on the left, and the alpha sen observation that are approximately equally deep with a near Leo appetizer, but now with pupil stabilized shopping. And one obvious difference is that the, the image on the right side looks much smoother in the background than the left side. So the, the field stabilized shopping where the, where the, where the, where the um, excess flux from the telescope rotates over the field of view, uh, leaves these horizontal structures that you see here. And, and you need the nodding correction to actually get rid of those. Um, when you have this cold pupil stop and you observe in a pupil stabilized mode, you don't have all that, then you can, um, you can do a, run a simple spatial filter to get rid of these smooth structures that you see here in the image. And so here is a, is a raw image, uh, shopping subtracted and only spatially filtered. And you see that it's a very clean uh, image that you get uh, alpha sent A and B here. And in the center, you have the chronographic image of A minus B. And in this particular observation, the, the sensitivity was even a bit better than previous on Leon Sirius. So here we achieved about 650 microtrans, D5 sigma per hour. And the contrast at one arc second, or a bit more than one arc second, at three lambda over D is of the order of 10 to the minus four or better. So you can see that here on the right photo. That's, that, that's a pretty good achievement. Also, when you use adaptive optics and pupil stabilized observations, uh, you can see that you have a, a 
very stable performance of the instrument. So this movie here shows, now run it, this movie shows a full night of observations of the near campaign where you see uh, actually it's, it's always a, one image every every minute and you can see how, how stable the situation is and the only thing actually that you see is uh, is the rotation of the field called the chronographic image in the center and the two off axis regular PSFs. So another thing that, 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 that we found out or investigated is the relation between the sky background and, and the water vapor contents of the atmosphere. So um, on the left side, you can see here on this, on this plot in red, the noise variance on the sky. And in blue, you see the, the, the water vapor uh, that was measured by the atmospheric scene monitor, uh, by the environmental monitor. And you, it's obvious that there is a pretty nice correlation uh, between the, the water vapor and uh, the noise variance. And um, what you can also see that is uh, there is almost a factor 2.5, so factor 2 to 2.5 difference in noise variance between the best nights, which was the first one and the 10th one, and the worst nights, which are seven and eight. And so that, that means because uh, the required observing time to reach a certain signal to noise ratio is proportional to the sky background variance, this means that the best nights are effectively twice longer than the worst one. And on the, on the uh, plot on the right side, you see uh, this is from a, from a recent paper where near data was also analyzed uh, to, to, to study the correlation between water vapor and uh, sky emission. Uh, you can see that it follows very nicely a trend that is also predicted by the sky, sky calc tool. And uh, you can also see here the, the impact of the water vapor on the sky background. Another thing to study, if you have 100 hour worth of data, you can, uh, you can check how the sensitivity scales uh, with exposure time. So uh, here we, we took the campaign data and uh, simply took a, a clean area on the sky, uh, calculated the noise on the sky, and then combined more and more data with it, uh, to it. You can see that uh, when we go to 100% of the campaign progress, uh, the, 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 the dependency of the noise over time follows very nicely the one over square root of time uh, law. So everything is as it should be. So where does it bring, uh, bring us in uh, our final 76 hours of good data? So you can see here the pixel to pixel noise uh, plotted as a, as, a, as a function of the separation from the, from the central chronographic image. And you can see that there is a, about a two times uh, basic, uh, what is it? Okay, so this is Chansky here, 10 to the minus 4 Chansky is 100 micro Chansky, so 0.1 milli Chansky. So it's about 200 micro Chansky in the inner part, um, where there's also the central glow and maybe some residual spectral, so it's slightly worse than the outer part of the image, where we can then really go down to about 100 micro Chansky uh, in sensitivity. And then there is this area here, which is um, spoiled by ADIs, data processing residuals. So between four and, and seven half second, there is uh, this, the, the binary star rotating through the through the data, and uh, so there the, the the contrast is, is is pretty bad in this image. So this was a pixel to pixel sensitivity, but what about contrast? So contrast is is better studied by inserting artificial sources into the data uh, before ADI processing, and you can see this was done here on the, on the image to the to the left. You can see that uh, the three times 10 to the minus six planet of, of, uh, injected at about uh, 1.3 arc second separation um, is quite visible. So um, when we plot this, uh, in, uh, we do these tests at different separations at different locations and kind of work out this, this uh, curve uh, where we would detect a potential companion. And this is a, this is a solid black line that is shown on the, on the right side. You can see here that this solid black line is uh, quite a bit, is about a, a factor two to three above uh, three to above the, the pixel to pixel noise. So that means that our artificial sources show up when we insert them at about a level of 10 sigma with respect to the pixel noise. Marcus, you have about five minutes left. Okay, thanks. So, um, the question in the outer part, I was talking about this 100, uh, 100 microchansky sensitivity that we get. So is that really the photo noise limit that we get here? 
And here you see a, a back of the envelope calculation, assuming that we had 17 electrons per digital unit in, in the VCR cryos detector acquisition system. Then with the brightness of alpha SNA, um, you can calculate what is the theoretical photon flux uh, that, that would arise from the star. What do we see on the near detector? And then you can estimate the throughput actually by uh, scaling our digital units to electrons and then uh, make the ratio with the right scalings in terms of square meters, exposure time, micrometers, uh, bandwidth of the filter, and so on. And so when we do that, what we see is that the, the throughput of the whole system, atmosphere, telescope, optics, detector, is of the order of 11%. And then we can do the same exercise for the sky background. In near, we measure about 10 to the four digital units in one six millisecond frame per pixel. And uh, so this would correspond then to about 10 to the nine uh, photons per square meter per second per micrometer per square arc second. And this is uh, to be compared to the 0.6 or 0.7 that we uh, basically got from the sky calc uh, uh, in plot that I showed for the filter. So all fits very well together. I mean, it makes, makes sense what we see. And then if we then scale from six milliseconds to 76 hours, um, we would expect a signal to noise ratio on alpha sen of 6.7 times 10 to the six. And what we actually actually measure in our data is 5.9 times 10 to the 6. So within 10%, I think it's fair to say that near really hits the photon noise background limit. So there, there are two things uh, what, what we can do to, 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 to do better even than this near. I mean, one obviously is the Aquarius detector. I guess we will hear a bit more about that. And the, the main takeaway message here is that if you, the alpha cryos, uh, sorry, the geosnap detector. The geosnap detector will avoid the need for chopping. And chopping means that you have always, you combine two images where you only have the signal in one of the two images. If you do not chop, you have the signal in both images. So you actually double the signal to noise ratio. And then on top of that, you have a quantum efficiency gain uh, over of the geosnap over the aquarius. That's at least the expectation. So the total signal to noise ratio gain should be a factor of about three, 2.3. Uh, and that translates into about five times faster observation to reach a certain signal to noise ratio. So with such a detector, uh, instead of going to something that is uh, well, like on the 100 micro Chansky range, you can with a single telescope, you go something to 40 to 50 micro Chansky. Uh, and if you would combine, that was the uh, initial idea that we had with the, in the Breakthrough Watch Committee, three big telescopes of Magellan, Gemini, and, and the VLT. Uh, observing alpha sen at the same time for about 100 hours. I mean, these three together could then start to, to reach sensitivities that would, in principle, allow you to see Earth-sized planets. So this brings me to my summary slide that um, near is a successful collaboration between ESO and the breakthrough initiatives uh, and many partners involved to contribute to this project. The sensitivity is well understood. We are photonoise limited. Uh, the, the noise scales with one over a period of time. Sensitivity that we get is 0.75 uh, millijanski in a five second one hour. And uh, we also see that it is important to observe during low uh, humidity conditions because then we have uh, effectively uh, only half the background noise. Uh, the contrast that is achieved is about three times 10 to the minus six at uh, four lambda over D, uh, which is also a very, very, very good result. It's, a, it's unfortunately a bit less. We thought we hit the, uh, the this, the pixel to pixel noise limit also in this angular separation, there's a, there's a factor two missing somewhere. So there must be some residual spectral noise that doesn't really subtract out. But the, there are very appealing prospects uh, for a geo and snap detector upgrade. So with the VLT only, super Earth to mini Neptune planets could be reached. If you would put three telescopes uh, together, you would even go down to super Earth, Earth analog regime. And um, I will stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Well, let's see, I see a few questions on the Slack channel. So let me start with this one. It starts with a terrible pun saying, I think Nier has brought us very far. Um, and then the question is, I heard that the Dickey switch you mentioned has been commissioned, but not used during the actual observations of Alpha Sen. Is that correct? And if so, what does the gain of 1.5 you listed in your signal noise table refer to? Okay. So the, uh, the DICA switch was actually not used during the alpha SEM observation. And the main reason was that if we chop with the DSM, um, we can get both stars 
at the same time. So we chop between alpha set A and B, and the chopping uh, the subtracted image provides would in principle provide us a positive planet signal in the from alpha set A and a negative one from alpha set B. So we can get two stars at the same time. The other reason is um, I only touched it in the talk. There was this uh, this central glow of the HEPM, and this is not seen in the thicker sky image. So this does not subtract out, and that is that is basically a, a, a killer argument for not using the tick switch for our chronographic observations. For regular imaging, it's still okay. And the factor 1.5 um, applies to DSM chopping with 10 hertz or ticket switch chopping with 10 hertz, independent of which kind of chopping you use. So this factor is still there, even if you chop with a DSM. Great. So there's another question here. What was the reason to use all three telescopes simultaneously for the original breakthrough program? Uh, was it about the variability of the source? Wouldn't it be much easier to spend the entire time on one telescope in terms of combining data, understanding systematics, et cetera? Yeah, actually the, the, the reason for understanding systematics was, was the argument to use three telescopes because if you would have a detection um, or at least a, a low signal to noise ratio detection in each of them, which then combines to a, to a reasonably high signal to noise rate, uh, ratio detection when you take all three telescopes, was considered as a, as a plus. So, um, of course, if you have a very strong detection with one instrument and uh, basically no signal in the other two, then the combination may, may still be at five sigma, but then actually you would reject the hypothesis that there is a plan. So using independent instruments, independent telescopes, um, is good to, 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 to reduce your false alarm possibility. Great. Well, I have one simple question to, to end us. Um, I was curious, so you, you found out that this precipitable water really matters, but can you actually do anything about that in terms of scheduling? Can you actually schedule your observations only on certain nights? Yes. I mean, if we, if we would repeat such observations, then we would probably sit there during the time that, that we did initially three weeks or so we were at the telescope and we were observing all the time when, the, when it was possible there were lots of clouds and so on. I think if we would reschedule it what we would do is that we would only choose the really low uh, water vapor nights because the high water vapor nights do not really bring us uh, significantly further down in sensitivity. Uh, it's, it's better to use this time in the near infrared or optical observations.